I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. I'm Angelie Preston. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're gonna have some real healing. We've gotta have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. Welcome to What's Next. Today, we have three guests, and we're going to talk about an upcoming panel discussion. Say Yes Buffalo uh, putting this on. Actually, it's going to take place here at Buffalo Toronto Public Media's main studio. Uh, they are renting the space for this day, February 15th, right? Absolutely. Stephanie Pete with us. Um, and Stephanie, we'll talk with you first and foremost as the uh, Director of uh, Workforce Development at Say Yes, and also uh, the person who's organizing this, uh, this panel discussion. Let's start with the title. The title of the panel discussion. It's very it's it's got quite the name to it. Yeah, absolutely. So um we're talking about the book White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide, um, by Carol Anderson. And the panel discussion is really focusing on the organized uh, uh resistance to black progress and we're looking at it through the lens of workforce development and education. And uh, you also have opened this up to the public, of course, whoever wants to attend. There's probably a, an opportunity. We can maybe talk about that later in the program. But Absolutely. but the key part of it is what you're talking about, workforce development, is mm-hmm. getting some of the main employers yes. in Western New York in the room to talk about this. Connect the dots a little bit there, uh, you know, because I think in some ways, you know, just the, the term white rage mm-hmm. in the name of the, the book might stand out on its own. And it might be a... a uh, obviously, you know why you went about doing this. So connect the, the dots there a little bit for us. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I recommended this book on LinkedIn a few months ago, and people started reading it and, and requested a discussion. So we decided to plan it. Um, we're focusing on this book because uh, I think the the term white rage or the title white rage elicits like this, we talked about before, this imagery of violence mm-hmm. and something that you can visually see. But uh, as Carol Anderson explores in this book, it's really about how those feelings were channeled into legislation and policy. So when we look at Buffalo and see the segregation, we know the economic in, um, inequity in our community, that is a remnant of you know of the laws and the policies that were happening nationally and that were funneled locally. So what we wanna do is bring employers together to one, talk about the book, um, explore the local, da- local data, but also talk about, okay, so what can we do differently in our seats? We don't have to wait on anyone. We can come together as employers, as workforce trainers, as philanthropy, um, as business leaders. What can we do um, to come together and actually change what uh, this looks like in our community for young people and their families and our general community? Also with us, uh, we were going to have the moderator of the event, uh, Will Green, uh, who is uh, from uh, Tremor, uh, Tremonte Solutions, and also now the assistant dean uh, at uh, the University of Buffalo uh, for, um, I'll let you give the whole title here, Will. The whole <laughs> title is, because it's brand new, right? Yeah, brand new. Uh, what's the title again? Your new title? Assistant, assistant dean. dean for Outreach and Community Engagement Outreach. at the Graduate School of Education. Congratulations of on the, on the new you. position, for sure. Thank you. And also with us, we have uh, Rob Latest from Invest Buffalo Niagara with their uh, business intelligence and workforce manager, Thanks for joining us, Rob. Thank you for welcoming me. All right, so let's let's expand the conversation here. Then first, um, let's go to Rob. Rob, our, from a, a workforce development workforce uh, development perspective, what's how do you see this panel discussion working here in terms of what you you think employers might get from this? Well, a couple of years ago, we did a labor market assessment for the eight county Buffalo Niagara region, incorporated feedback from 150 stakeholders. We brought in a global national consultant, uh, Newmark, to lead the study for us because of their data capabilities, but also their intel with industry needs, as we're seeing a lot of growth in manufacturing and other emerging industries. And we wanted to see what our gaps were for being able to match our local talent with what these new opportunities are going to look like. After doing the study, they identified 20 occupations that they've identified as being key for our region's growth. When you take a look at the demographic profile of those occupations, only one 
is close to the regional demographic makeup of our region for our black and African-American population and only a couple for our Hispanic population. So right now, the current paradigm is we do not have the representation within these key occupations that are going to determine whether or not our region can land opportunities, but then also our vitality moving forward. Uh, what, you said there was just one uh, for the black demographic. What was that? Truck drivers. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Well, that's uh, interesting to know. So so there's a lot of room for growth in this regard, and, and this is where we have to get everybody in the same room. Will, you're going to have to moderate this, these d- different uh, panelists here as well. Give me some of your thoughts about this, you know, going in. It's still a couple of weeks off. There's some work to be done between now and then. But in terms of leading uh, this group of people, and it's going to be a, uh, we'll use the word diverse because it's going to be, I think, you know, when it comes to employers, it sounds like we've got a lot of different types of employers from Western New York. What's your strategy moving forward here? Uh, really, it's just to bring the panelists together to look at some key points from the book. Um, I love the way that the book is structured and looking at some key historical uh, elements and key historical time frames and really just get the panelists to open up about their personal feelings about those events, what's happening currently, and how it impacts what's happening in the workforce. What are the possibilities of a panel discussion? Let's look at that, right? You know, it sounds like <laughs> you got an idea of what, what you want to do and how to keep it moving. But what can we gain when it's a panel discussion? There's multiple people giving their their thoughts and perspectives. Well, I think because, number one, we're looking at workforce development, right? Um, So we got someone from Hodge and Russ, um, Hodge and Russ, Mm -hmm. right? So that's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um, We have someone from National Fuel. Um, Of course, we have Stephanie and Rob. So we've got these different elements of workforce development and workforce period. But I think what's interesting is how do we all narrow it down, I guess, and go backwards, because that's what uh, Carol Anderson is able to do. How do we go backwards and look at the things that have happened and how they continue to impact, you know, workforce? What do we consider as professional? What does professional mean when you really start to think about it? I remember a few years ago, there was a CEO that came out like, hey, I'd love to hire more diverse staff, but they're just not qualified. Mm. What does it mean to be qualified? And hopefully the panel can speak to that because it hasn't been my experience um, in the workforce in Buffalo that folks aren't qualified. It's that they're coming in with different cultural norms, different ways of interacting. And because of these longstanding traditional concepts of what it means to be a professional, they're being alienated, ostracized and moved out the door. Well, that's you've touched upon uh, some really interesting stuff there, Will. Let's switch back to, to Rob for just a second, though. When you like what you just heard Will saying right there, there is a divide then between what employers want, what they think they want, maybe is even a better way of describing it, and what is really available in this market, or is there more development that's needed? There's, there's always going to be more development that's needed. I think what we're definitely emphasizing across the region is employer participation within the talent development pipeline. We're oftentimes focused on the entry-level roles, but as equal are the mid-level roles as well. And as you are expanding the talent sources and being more inclusive of groups that are currently underrepresented at your place of employment, you are building that bench larger for the potential next first-line supervisors and ideally future innovators in town. I think part of the benefit of the panel discussion we bring in that industry diversity. So you have industries like healthcare where there is a lot of representation and they're able to then educate employers in spaces where maybe there's less like Mm. manufacturing on best practices they've seen. But even then, you know, manufacturing is able to share some of the best practices they have on talent development overall on things like apprenticeship and the like that moves people up that pathway from being at that entry level role to some of those more higher level ones that honestly are the ones that we as a region need to be generating more of from that pipeline of existing workers as opposed to just having people land in those roles fresh out of high school. I want to step to uh, Stephanie because you're the reader of all of us here, of course. Uh, The book, White Rage Mm -hmm. by Carol Anderson, New York Times bestseller. Uh, It's got a a spectacular title for sure. Mm -hmm. Yet the title in some regards could be considered misleading because as I mentioned, I think before we went on the air, 
you know, when I think of white rage, I'm thinking of somebody who's you know yelling at the cable news channel as they're watching uh, the news at uh, at uh, 10 o'clock at night, or whatever the case may be. But there, there's more subtlety to to it than than just that. Absolutely. Um, so I think what's really important. I wanted to have this panel discussion because I wanted people to understand that you don't have to identify with the white rage to be able to see that it exists. Mm. So like we're all living in this system that was created by this rage to keep uh, black people specifically out of key positions, you know, uh, to limit education, to limit our workforce participation. And if we're not, like Will said, like looking at what's right now and moving backwards to understand how we got here, how do we unravel it? How do we create something that works better for everyone unless we understand where it actually came from? So, I mean, the, the title is definitely provocative, mm -hmm. but I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think having this discussion will help folks who um, would never read this book on their own. You know what I mean? Like this discussion, I think, is very accessible. Um, we're going to have a conversation with a group of people who come from different walks of life, but really want to see Buffalo win. And it's not we can't win unless we talk about the inequities in our community and what we're going to do. Because everyone has a responsibility. We're not looking to point fingers of who did what, who didn't do what. That doesn't matter anymore. We have some solutions that we think could work. Let's come together and all put our hands in and move things forward so our community is much more equitable. Let's maybe um, um, let this broaden out and let everybody kind of chime in where they want to come in on this. You know, we can talk about what's in white rage and about some of the, the policy and or legislation that that have been developed throughout the years that have kept people you know, separated, that have kept people down for sure. What do we see here in West New York? Is there an understanding among employers that, you know, they're kind of what you were talking about a little bit there earlier, Will, about the idea that the perception of what a professional is is not really in tune with what an, an employer is needed, or an, an employer may need, or what a, an employer could utilize. So, I guess what I'm asking here is, is there an understanding among employers that, yeah, we're maybe getting people who don't fit a certain mold, but yet have so much to to offer? I mean, I want to see if we can kind of connect the dots, maybe make this a, more of a local discussion. Who wants to try to? take that one in first I mean I'll start I think we have a lot of employers um, so at SAS we have our modern youth apprenticeship framework um, career wise greater Buffalo that we launched in 2021 from what we're seeing we have a lot of employers who they see okay yes there's something that we can be doing differently like we're not seeing the diversity that we want it's a matter of capacity and understanding how to go about that um, so I think the sweet spot with our team at say yes we're all from Buffalo Public Schools all but maybe one or two of us on our entire team we all live in a city, so we're very well equipped to kind of like build, bridge that gap between employers not really understanding how to connect with um, the kids graduating out of our district and our young people who want to work, you know, they want to do well for themselves, they want to take care of their families, they want to be thriving young adults, but haven't really figured out how to navigate, you know, their that career pathway just yet. We're right there in the middle to provide support on both ends. Um, and in our, 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 our apprenticeship framework, uh, we meet with our employer partners once a month. And it's not just us giving them best practices on how to work with our young people. They're also sharing what they're doing and what's working. So it's a really amazing space that we've created for employers to talk about doing things that are completely different than how they've been doing it in the years past. So you're talking about 18-year-olds who are getting hired for roles in, like, HR and, like, data analytics um, for with companies like M and and Rich Products and you know Delaware North and Wegman, so it's really it's an amazing opportunity for employers to say, okay, you know we want to do something different. We want our you know we have talent needs, of course everyone does, but we want to make sure that we're being a lot more inclusive. We want to tap into the talent that's local, and that's the way to do it. You heard her comments. Who wants to maybe add on to that a little bit? Yeah, I think the one thing that keeps coming up in the back of my mind is how nuanced the conversation is. And there's so many cracks and crevices to the conversation. I mean, creating those spaces where people can come together and talk about those nuances and share failures and successes is vital. Because mm -hmm. if we just talked about workforce development and organizational culture in itself is a massive topic to break down. And there are some organizations that have positive culture and they allow communication to flow from the bottom to the top. And there are some cultures that don't. When you mix in 
coming from a city that's segregated like mm-hmm. Buffalo, mm-hmm. right? How does segregation in communities impact changing the workforce or workplace diversity in an organization? You got to have those conversations because you may have the want to and the desire to change it. But if you don't understand what it means to live in a community where there are very few people who look different from you, Mm -hmm. how will you deal with that in a workplace when emotions get involved? Mm -hmm. When policy gets involved, that is not quite where it should be Mm -hmm. for everyone if they look the same. Mm -hmm. So it's a super nuanced conversation, but it has to start with bringing all those people together and people being willing to be open and honest about who they are, addressing some bias, and being open to seeing things in a different light to allow opportunity for growth. Rob, what about you? As you're hearing the conversation here, what flashed in your mind? You know, the way that we've been talking about this recently is it's it's a good problem that we're in in Buffalo and that we've really gone through a renaissance as far as opportunities here. And of course, there's the national landscape of a talent shortage everywhere, right? In Buffalo, though, we had generations of having more job candidates than openings. Right. It is a flipped landscape now. So a lot of this is helping to educate the local employers on the best practices for engaging talent that still needs to be developed to an extent. And you're doing things like being intentional about who the first line supervisor is going to be, having training for that first line supervisor on what it means to mentor a new hire, having standard operating procedures for what that person is going to be expected to do so that the talent and the supervisor are on the same page. It really is about removing the false negatives on both sides Mm -hmm. that this isn't going to be a good match for us. So I think what I'm really excited about when we talk about this work, you see a lot of really motivated, passionate young professionals who by engaging in this talent development and being intentional about it coming from diverse pipelines, they're developing a lot of leadership skills. They're going to be fantastic leaders for us in the next generation. It's um, encouraging to, to hear that for sure. What about on the other side, though? What What's stopping it? Because when you're talking about, okay, the first-line supervisor, you know, being intentional about who that person is, you know, how they look, where they come from, that's, that's interesting. But at the same time, not everybody's doing it, right? I mean, it sounds easy as we sit here and talk about <laughs> it, but we're, that's not what we see everywhere right here in western new york or obviously across the country but what about that who wants to maybe talk about what what are the what are the obstacles right now i mean it's really you have to find the people who are willing to do it so what we um do at say yes you know we might be getting a yes from a ceo but we need to get a yes from every level of leadership so we Mm -hmm. need yes from hiring managers we need yes from hr directors it has to be you mean there's something going on in an organization that a ceo <laughs> might not know <laughs> <laughs> no just, you know they get ex- you know you might have a leader saying yes this is absolutely great but like we need all the human beings who are going to be involved right. in the decision making who are going to be involved in hiring and uh working with our young people to all be on the same board because um it is a, it's it's it's, an, it's a personal investment on your end to do things differently than how you've done it and that's not easy for anyone Um, especially when we're having you know tough conversations around racial equity in our community um, and you know practices that may need to change you know every company has invested tons of money tons of time into policies and procedures to make sure their business operates but have they been developed with an 18 year old in mind no most (laughs) most places no right so that's going to really be a shift and culture, a shift and, you know, practices. And, you know, we recognize that's a lot of work for employers. So it really has, you have to identify the people who want to take that on. Who wants to mentor an 18 year old? And we say to our employers all the time, they're not just, you know, coming into the workforce, you know, fresh. They are transitioning into adulthood. It's, that's such a huge time for learning. Um, so it has to be the folks who really, you know, want to embrace that in order to, you know, bring in young talent, especially talent from underrepresented communities. Well, I saw you nodding your head uh, pretty profusely as Mm -hmm. Stephanie was talking. If you have something to add, please. Yeah, uh, so at the end of the day, right, for most organizations and companies and businesses, there is a bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to 
navigate all these other things that are happening when you have to meet deadlines, mm -hmm. you have to produce, right? Mm -hmm. So you do need to have that, and I said organizational culture, you need that top-down organizational commitment to yep. change. They need to understand that if we are able to turn the corner on this change, our organization will be better off. Yep. One of the obstacles, well, actually a couple obstacles, is number one, if you have people thinking that it's just charity. Yes. We're just doing this just because we need to help these folks out. Right. Mm -hmm. It won't work. It won't work. You have to believe that we need these people to do better things that we want to do in our organization. Um, and the other issue is it's hard. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. And it, it takes me back to the book. And what I can appreciate appreciate about how Carol Anderson has set this up is she goes through, she starts at Reconstruction, which, honestly, if you want to study race relations in America, you got to take a look at Reconstruction because the question we need to ask is, well, Civil War, North won, slavery should have been done. What happened? Didn't we go down into the South and eradicate plantations? Didn't we have black elected officials in mass? How did that turn into Jim Crow? Those are questions that have to be asked, right? So these are things that are baked into American culture, right? So if we want to do the hard work of deconstructing the ingredients to figure out how we got there, we're going to have to be committed to it. Right. And going back to what I said about businesses have a bottom line, when you have to measure and weigh bottom line and helping this person get into here, it becomes that challenge of, eh, I, I got to do this. And it becomes easier to focus on the bottom line as opposed to focusing on changing the way we do business. Mm -hmm. And once again, if you don't believe that you're bringing people in in a diverse capacity to do better in the business, why would you hang on to it? Right. So that that's the difficulty in it. And Stephanie's completely correct because you got to have that top down agreement in an organization from CEO down to entry level worker. Mm -hmm. Now, I ask this question, how many organizations do you know exist like that? <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not making me answer. Uh, <laughs> Stay with us. There's more to come. This is What's Next on WBFO. This is the Buffalo Toronto Public Media History Bite, bringing you a peek into significant historical events for the week of February 5th through February 11th. I'm your host and program director, Tom Barich. February 5th, 1826, Buffalo resident and future president Millard Fillmore marries in Moravia, New York. The first meeting of the Erie County Anti-Slavery Society occurred in East Aurora, New York on February 7th, 1837. February 10th, 1810, the town of Buffalo establishes itself as it separates from the town of Clarence, New York. We're certainly no stranger to winter conditions in western New York, especially in the last couple of years, but the coldest day on record for western New York was February 9th, 1934, when the temperature hit a very chilly negative 21 degrees Fahrenheit. And for our Canadian friends and neighbors, that is a whopping negative 29 and a half degrees Celsius. Well, remember what I said about Millard Fillmore at the beginning of this segment? February must have had a special meaning to Millard because he married his second wife, Caroline Carmichael, on February 10th, 1858. You've been listening to the WBFO History Bite. Discover more stories about Western New York's past on the Buffalo History Museum's website. Learn more at buffalohistory.org. For Buffalo Toronto Public Media, I'm Tom Barich. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. We're here on uh, What's Next with uh, Stephanie, Pete, Will Green, and Rob Latest talking about the upcoming panel discussion uh, titled 
for lack of a better term, White Rage, but it's part of their Workforce uh, Development Series. Uh, Rob, then let's maybe, uh, I'll, I'll throw this, the tough one to you then. What's the benefit then? The, like, like Will was getting into there, it's tough work. There's a lot to be done here. You know, you've got to, in some cases, change culture. A lot of people are going to say it doesn't help our bottom line. It might not help our bottom line. How does that, how, how do you overcome that? That obstacle, because it sounds like a big one. Yeah. Looking at the benchmarks as to how you're doing on talent acquisition and retention, you're going to see it in the bottom line by expanding your network and expanding your talent pipeline. Um, You waste a lot of time at organizations hiring folks that don't work out. Um, Working on that persistence of somebody that is a new hire through up to that mid-level role should be one of those metrics that you want to take a look at. I think the organizations that currently have great representation across demographics. Oftentimes they'll have benchmarks as to how many folks within a certain demographic are now our first line supervisors or beyond. I can think of an insurance company that Stephanie and I were chatting with recently that has a great brochure on that. Uh, Allowing yourself to look at those benchmarks without being afraid I think is a really good first step. And that's something that we oftentimes elevate within the panel discussion. And part of that is also elevating folks in town that can help with it, right? That's some of those actionable next steps that organizations can take for that base level. Then there's also that peer-to-peer learning both across companies, but then within occupations. So an event like the Employer Think Tank Series, the White Rage event that's coming up, we've got over 100 uh, folks attending. I'm sure we're gonna have a lot more. Uh, And it's really a good networking opportunity for some of the individuals that are in the HR roles to be able to talk across organizations as to actual implementation best practices. There's also groups like the Buffalo Niagara Human Resources Association that can be an asset for the practitioners that are doing the talent acquisition and the talent stewardship across orgs to basically actually go through, here's the specific problem that I'm having with accessing this particular population of of workforce, or here's a gap that I'm seeing in their skill set. The beauty is once you start developing that critical mass of employers and practitioners, now we can start going to the education providers, the faculty members, and updating that curricula so that we have better alignment. So the more that we work at this together, the easier it's going to be for the talent to be more close to being ready to be productive for you as an organization, but then also that upward mobility. That's really going to be the key because when I look at these target occupations, these are not entry-level roles. These are the roles that we need some more advanced skill sets for, but they're the ones that help you as a company to make money. Um, As you were saying that, though, I'm I'm going to jump to the assumption that you are seeing companies, though, that are benefiting from this intentional practice. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, I I think that in Buffalo, one thing that we want to make sure that we elevate, we have enough people here. A lot of other regions are begging to have more folks move here. We are super inclusive as far as welcoming refugees and immigrants. We have a large international student population that's coming into town. And one of the uh, keys for talking about this particular group that is currently underrepresented within our workforce, this isn't a help them get into the jobs that we need um, or else our companies might not succeed. It's help them get into the jobs that are going to have them thrive so they stay in our region, Mm -hmm. right? Mobility of folks is increasing more and more, and this talent is good. So being an employer of choice for this group is only going to help. I think that's why we see um, industries like healthcare and education that have such large representation from our black and African-American population having a slightly easier time accessing talent than organizations like our manufacturers that are coming to us all the time asking for help finding candidates. That's interesting, though, the the manufacturing element. Does anybody have a thought about what, what what that obstacle stands to be. I, I see everybody kind of looking at each other for a little bit of this and it, because we do hear about that. We've heard about that now for, I think, several years. I mean, it's not just uh, or simply um, a matter of, uh, of demographics. It sounds like it, it's just a, it's a difficult jump for these companies trying to, to, make that, to, to make that connection. Yeah, I mean, I have a few thoughts anecdotally. Anod- anod- I don't know. Sorry. Coffee. Um, <laughs> one... I think a lot of kids don't know what advanced manufacturing right. is. You know, they think of it as this, you know, I'm going to be dirty <laughs> working on these big machines. It doesn't seem desirable. And also a lot of black kids have been hearing college, college, college for quite a while. So they don't associate that with that industry. 
Um, and we've seen on our end um, having to do a lot of education with young people around what, you know, what is CNC machining or what is this company, what is advanced manufacturing. And it's something that um, is, you know, top of mind for us um, as we move forward with our workforce portfolio. But it's definitely some re-education um, because, you know, young people don't consider it as a viable career, even though you can make great money right. <laughs> in that industry. How great. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is the um, geographic location of a lot of our manufacturers in our region. Um, we had a loss of manufacturing within the east side of Buffalo, mm -hmm. as well as in areas like Lackawanna. We're bringing back companies into uh, the Renaissance Commerce Park that's down there. Uh, you look at the occupation demographics that are strong within our black community, and a lot of it, customer service reps, retail salespeople, a lot of those jobs are accessible to these neighborhoods, whereas mm -hmm. manufacturers require, one, there's, there's, there's a lot larger of a base of smaller companies. I think when we talk about this work, it has been easier for the larger companies to be able to do it because they just have more people. Mm. They can devote a person to being the apprenticeship lead, whereas the smaller companies probably need that critical mass across each other in order to help to develop those best practice strategies in order to lift up some of the mentors that maybe are the examples of students coming through the Buffalo public school system that have made it into manufacturing so that we can create that flywheel effect. Um, Will, did you come out of the Buffalo public schools? Yep. So uh, maybe uh, how about your experience? I mean, again, you know, we're, we're a little beyond mm -hmm. this time. I, you know, when I came of age, it, it was kind of what, what Rob was saying, plenty of candidates, no jobs. Mm -hmm. Now it's a different story, but I'm maybe from your experience, Coming out, if you can remember what it was like being a being a student, and if these types of things were being discussed, you know, was there an, an atmosphere of yeah, let's let's go, let's find out what's out there, or was there a lack of connection? I, I guess I'm just asking for some personal thoughts on this. Yeah, proud graduate of public school, community school 53, okay. and Hutch Tech. Oh, congratulations. Um, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> hey, Hutch Tech, great school. Um, but <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I don't recall getting much direction as now 53 K through eight excel do well right. right and then your future will be laid out for you um, but in high school you know and I've been on this show a couple times I talked about my high school yep. experience. I, I, I like met, hearing it <laughs> yeah I met my guidance counselor twice one of them was because the college that I got accepted to called me and told me to go talk to him <laughs> so <laughs> not a lot of direction right um, you know growing up in the 90s the early 90s Reagan era <laughs> <laughs> there were not a lot of opportunities or yeah when you go, get out of here you can go there for a job it was pushing the college education um just in my experience working as a professional though i think what we say about advanced manufacturing is is on point um a long time ago in another profession i did some work with um creating uh training for life sciences manufacturing positions mm -hmm. And these companies were existing right inside the city, but they were buildings that were small. They were local, but none of the people that I knew knew about them. Mm -hmm. But because I was talking to the CEOs and the workforce development people, we're going to visit these places. I'm like, this is right here on the east side? Hmm. And you go into the building, and there's not a lot of representation for people from the east side. Now, I, I can take it back to the book, because what I can tell you is that this country does very well with directing people where it feels they should go and Absolutely. belong. If you look across the country, there's a high representation of black folks in the medical field. I think Buffalo is unique in terms of education because we have a higher percentage of black teachers and black Im administrators in most of the state, if I'm correct. Um, so that's a very interesting perspective, but I think it's about connectivity where people are but i think we really need to look at how people learn about where their place is especially in jobs mm -hmm. and i think we'll be able to discuss some of that through the lens of the book and through the expertise of the panelists because i don't i don't know that answer right in college i was uh going for my undergrad in english and i'm like what can i do with an english degree hmm. so oh i could teach <laughs> I wish someone had said, oh, you can go on a law with an English degree. Right. But I didn't have that type of input. 
So it'll be interesting to kind of uncover these things and ask these questions organically to the panelists and see what we can pull from it. So it's fair to say, perhaps, that I don't want to I don't want to uh, victimize anybody, but here in the sense that it's not just an attitude by CEOs. It's not just an attitude inside organizations. It also could be it's also part of perhaps what's going on in schools. It's what's going on elsewhere as well. I mean, there's, there's there it's. There's a lot of levels to this. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to figure out mm -hmm. locally around career explora exploration. You know, all of the data, you know, Rob mentioned the Invest Buffalo Niagara labor market assessment. Um, tech Buffalo did an assessment recently for the tech industry. And what we're seeing and everything that's create uh, that's been studied is that career exploration needs to happen as early as middle school or, or younger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, broadly, it's not happening. Um, and my situation is similar to Will. My mother picked my uh, uh, major in college. She was, <laughs> I didn't talk to anybody in school, and I went to City Honors. <laughs> not to knock <laughs> the school, but no one talked to me about what I'm going to do afterwards. <laughs> my mom was like, yeah, uh, you should be, based on how you learn and what you like, mm -hmm. take these majors. And I was like, okay. And, you know, <laughs> that was pretty much my experience. And then I figured it out. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there is a ton of work to be done because young people, you know, they know what they're exposed to. I wanted to be a teacher for a while because my mom was a teacher. Right. Mm. I'm definitely not teacher material at all. <laughs> Why is there a teacher? Mm, I don't know. So, <laughs> I want to add, though, so it, we got to throw the word in there. It's systemic. Right? Absolutely. And to bring it back to the book. So when we think white rage, we don't think systems. Right. Mm -hmm. But she's very much describing through the titles of her chapters mm -hmm. the systems that have been put into place through legislation, through the stroke of a pen that have created the mentality for all the folks who are part of this national fabric. Right. And that's what we're going to be looking at and trying to break down of how do we automatically know that we need to treat people a certain way or people need to go a certain way is Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson, the creator of Black History Week that turned into Black History Month, mm -hmm. said you don't have to teach tell a man where to go if you teach him what to think. Right. <laughs> if you tell him how to think, you don't have to tell him where to go. Right. How have we gotten to this place? Here's a, a, a tougher question, and I'll, I'll let anybody take it any way they want. It's a simple yes or no or expand. The book talks a lot about policies and legislation that have been set up on a national basis for the most part or uh, that have followed, for example, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education uh, ruling of the, the 1950s and how some school districts went about immediately to find ways to overcome it uh, and, and to basically deny the, the spirit of the ruling. What about here in Buffalo? I, are there policies or have there been policies in place that have are slowly being pushed away that are blocking this kind of connection that we see here where we have people who could be the talent that could help these companies make this more a, a better, more thriving area where it's it's equitable, where everybody is, is enjoying the success of, of a booming economy. Anybody want to try to take that one on? I mean, I, I, it's always tough. I mean, I, I see smirks and, oh, yeah, I can think of a couple of things, I'm sure. But, you know, can are there things that we can maybe generally talk about that uh, – Worth are worth making a mention of about what's happened locally here historically. Can I can I give a working example? I mean, I think Go this ahead, is a Will. perfect example of what <laughs> uh, Carol Anderson is doing in the yep. book. So redlining, mm -hmm. right? It, it, and I think everybody here is familiar with redlining. These were intentional decisions to devalue communities where Black people lived and keep them in those communities and prevent access to the communities that had higher value, right? So if you look at history, how has that played out today? We still have a very divided city, east, west, north, south. You have an influx of new Americans into those communities, and how is that impacting the individuals in those communities? I would say that maybe we can't point directly to legislation right now as it exists that continues to disenfranchise people from those devalued communities, but the essence of it still exists when people from those communities attempt to go to better schools, attempt to get into better jobs. Some of those feelings still permeate the spaces. I consider myself to be a professional, and I think we go back to the title of White Rage. It's not necessarily loud, 
but it is something that wears on you every day in professional spaces that makes you feel alienated, that makes you say, you know what, I don't have to take this, I can go somewhere else. Now, maybe the individuals who created this organizational culture to make me feel this way are not being intentional, but it's business as usual, right? And the end result is me leaving a space that could potentially change my future. So we, I, I can't point right. to specific but legislation But the existence now. of attitudes that, have, that were built upon Baked into the policies and redlining 50s and 60s. Right. We're talking about the expressway now and mm. how that could change uh, the fortunes of people in those communities and uplift the value of those communities a number of years ago. So here we are, same thing. Just yeah, piggyback, I'm sorry, piggybacking off of you um, with the redlining, that's how we fund schools. So right. the schools in, our, in, in, the most, in the poorest communities in the city of Buffalo. Um, because we're basing off of, you know, uh, taxes in the city and, you know, the tax base is, is really what's helping to fund the schools. Mm -hmm. Then we have schools who don't have the resources resources that they need. And even you just brought up the 33. Look at all of the lead poisoning that happened as a result mm -hmm. of that being in, our, in, in the black community. Lead poisoning that is irreversible. So we don't even know the true impact. <laughs> and we got the numbers. And a big thing <laughs> of, you know, you know, as an educator, Kids who are exposed to lead poisoning, behavioral issues, mm -hmm. learning disabilities, like the, we don't even know the true impact of this. So when we're talking about the harm from policies, you can spend all day. For anyone who hasn't read, what is it, The Heart of We Run mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by Dr. Dr. Taylor? Mm -hmm. yeah, phenomenal. It's a phenomenal study on um, Buffalo Seaside. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I saw, I, I saw uh, Rob uh, shaking his head as you were talking about education. Uh, go ahead. So I literally was going to bring up property values, <laughs> right? Property education. Values, yeah. So I love that we're always on the same page. And um, it, and you know, Will, you mentioned the, you know, and I referenced it before the new American population that's coming into the city. Keep in mind that part of that is because they're moving into low property value mm -hmm. locations, and then are increasing the costs mm -hmm. to the Buffalo public school system of providing services mm -hmm. such as English as a second language, and a lot of the work that happens with the apprenticeship work that SAS does has that intersectionality mm -hmm. of the children that come here as refugees that are then in the Buffalo public school system. And now we are working on the language barrier at employers on top of mm -hmm. what might be some misperception um, issues that employers have. I, I think a lot of it too comes back to, and I know a common metric that's brought up in our region is the isolation index. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what the redlining and, and moving to school districts that were better resourced did was it exasperated the racial equity, generational wealth divide that we have in our region. Um, so we have multiple generations of folks that just haven't gotten to meet each other. And that's where I wanna keep elevating events like we have coming up this month. It's a really great opportunity to try to start expanding your network of folks that are doing similar work to you that you might not have gotten a chance to meet absent this. And we need to really be intentional about breaking down those barriers that we currently have based upon geographic location. Mm -hmm. uh, but attitudes um, that have been built upon years of policies, decades of policies, mm -hmm. redlining was a great example, I think, of course. They create perceptions about people. People accept those perceptions. Do you still find those attitudes that you know still exist that, you know, when it comes to, to you know employers that are, whether you know they might say one thing but you can see in a, on another level no nah, i don't think they really quite get this the uh, the word that and we've chatted about this before two words that come up that immediately give me pause that that might be the case are soft skills mm. <laughs> um, so you know what what i try to um, reconfigure that to is you're talking about intercultural communication so if you aren't engaging with folks from various backgrounds, you might misperceive that cultural communication barrier as being a barrier to passion or work ethic or whatever it might be. Um, and I'm going to pause because I know, Stephanie, you can really lean into this. Um, I mean, you've already summed it up. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's code for, you know, how I think soft skills is really code for assimilation to like w w white norms <laughs> honestly um and yeah so I, tell all I it, have is soft skills, we, we, yeah. we don't use yeah. that term because that's really what it is is you know how much are we 
how much did you expect people to cold switch is really, you know, mm. into mm. and to um, conform to the white dominant culture and workplaces. And we really need to, as Rob said, you know, um, we really need to like just pull that apart and really talk about um, what does communication mean? And when you have folks from different backgrounds and different lived experiences, it's gonna it's gonna look different, right? Mm -hmm. And right. we have to embrace that. And um, you talked before about attitudes. You know, folks can have the right attitude and say the right things, but how are you operationalizing that within your organization? Because if you haven't looked at, if you say yes, we're all about equity or we're all about you know DEI or however you want to name it, but all your policies are still the same from two to three years ago, you haven't changed anything, then you know, you can want something as much as you want, but if it's not operationalized, it's not going to change anything within the organization. Mm. And that's why these spaces um, and these talk discussions or these discussions um, are so important because you bring all those people who are admitting that it's inequitable. Mm -hmm. And now they're starting to identify strategies to break down the inequity. Um, unfortunately, especially if we look at the history of some of the things that have happened here, the, the, the idea has always been, well, how do we get back to progress? And unfortunately, because of the systems baked into the country, to get to progress, you have to eliminate certain people from the space. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how you, if we, we talked about redlining, we want to increase property value. Well, now all of a sudden, you have a situation where historical black families cannot afford to live mm -hmm. on the east side of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So the solution, and we say, oh, well, that's good because property value has increased, but you still eliminated the opportunity for black families to live in a place of Buffalo that they've lived in traditionally. So now when we bring this back to workforce development, how do we create a solution that's beneficial for all without alienating and diminishing one group to say, oh, look, we got it, mm -hmm. right? Oh, we got it. We fixed it. No, there's still a large segment of the population who don't have access. That's the great thing about this space because people can come in and say, we want to be more equitable and we can look at the tools that you need to truly start to break these things out. And I love, Stephanie, that you said we need to operationalize it. In the work that I do as an educational consultant, when I talk to building administrators, when I talk to teachers, I can tell that they genuinely want things to change, but they don't know how to enact the policies and procedures to change. If we talk about the impetus being legislation, then the solution has to be conscientious legislation and holding people accountable so we can always point to, well, that's how you think it should be done, but based on this contract, this is how we're going to do it. And it has to be something that is protected. We're coming down to our uh, final 10 minutes or so here with our discussion today. With us, we have Stephanie Pete, Will Green, and Rob uh, Latest. We're talking about the upcoming panel discussion, uh, White Rage. Um, it's a workforce development uh, panel discussion being put on by uh, Say Yes Buffalo. Stephanie, before I don't want to let this get away. Let's make sure we touch on this right now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Employers are being invited. You're networking to get people in, but at the same time, open to the public. How Absolutely. can the public access this? Um, so it's on all of our social media platforms. Mm -hmm. For Say Yes Buffalo, has been posted on our LinkedIn, on our Facebook. Um, you can reach out to me personally, S-Pete, S-P-E-E-T-E, -E -E, <laughs> at sayyesbuffalo.org. Um, but yes, it is. We're, we're inviting employers and local leaders, but it's also open to the general public if they would just like to come and be a part of the conversation. And it does sound like it's an opportunity, you know, kind of going back before we were talking about networking opportunities. You know, it, it could really fill the bill for a lot of different people who aren't necessarily employers, right? They could come to something like this. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I, I think that there's really uh, a benefit of increasing the collaboration and interfacing of community advocates and connectors mm -hmm. to some of these employers too. So this will be an opportunity for organizations that have talent pipelines to come and have conversations with some of these employers. And really the employers that we're going to be expecting at this event are ones that are going to want to be taking proactive steps. So these could be really good employers of choice for your talent that you're currently acting as a steward for. And you, if, I think before we went on the air, you said this is actually part of a, a series of, of similar discussions that have been held. Yeah. Uh, maybe just give us a little background on that. Well, I'm all that Stephanie, yeah. she led this. Okay. So, yeah, we have an employer think tank series at Say Yes Buffalo. It started in 2020. Mm -hmm. 
um, for two reasons. Um, we had some employers who asked us to have more conversations around racial equity. Um, and then as a response to the murder of George Floyd, uh, we decided that we needed to convene um, the employers that we're working with locally and other leaders to have these like really honest um, conversations about how we can move forward collectively. Um, so it started virtually um, and we did four sessions um, over 200 uh, folks from 60 different organizations attended. So obviously there was an appetite for it. Um, once we launched our uh, Modern Youth Apprenticeship Program, I, I wanted to bring these back, but actually do them in person because I think there's just a different energy when sure. folks are in the same room. And the Oshai Foundation stepped up to um, fund um, this current series. And our partners for this work, although it started at Say Yes, um, we work collaboratively with Invest Buffalo Niagara, um, Buffalo Center for Art and Technology, and who am I missing? Tech Buffalo. Tech Buffalo. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Collaboration. Look yes. at that right in front of us. Yeah. Uh, what You said honest conversations. How honest? I mean, really, can you think of the highlights of I mean, or like somebody saying, uh, I just did not know this? I or, mean, so I, I, we uh, – Earlier in 2023, we had a conversation about decolonizing professionalism and communication. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a fan of the DEI phrase anymore. I want to be I want to say exactly what we mean. Um, so for us, it's we have conversations that are led by black and brown people. So there's no filter um, to say that we're having an event and we titled it White Rage. Um, we're just being very explicit in what the issue is. Um, and we invite folks to come in. As I said before, there's no finger pointing. This isn't like or anyone gets on their soapbox and you know and complain about anything we're saying this is what is happening this is what has happened so what are we going to do about it like and everyone has a role to play um so i i'm really thankful for those who collaborate and say yes to everything that i ask, <laughs> ask them to do <laughs> and for those who come into this space and they're willing to be vulnerable because they're they're not easy conversations right. at all but they're willing to come in um be brave be vulnerable and figure out okay this is what we can bring to the table so that we can move forward together, you know, as a region, as a city, um, to make sure that our economy is a lot more inclusive. Well, I, you know, I, I'll, I saw you nodding in there, but also just curious. You know, you've, you've been a professional now. You've you've seen what have you seen? Do you feel like more change is is possible? That it, this really can happen? Yeah, I mean, I would I wouldn't participate if I didn't think change was possible. Um, I, I think where we are with this work, and this is a continuation of work that folks have been doing for a long time, ever since Reconstruction, when legislation was put in place to disenfranchise other people. So this is just a continuation of it. I think what it does is create a space for folks to share stories that they haven't been able to share. Mm -hmm. um, and these are people who would other folks would say are successful have successfully navigated the system, are leaders in their industries, and they are telling you real stories about things that have happened to them that are, you know, unfathomable for other people. And the people who come and listen and hear about these stories are also impacted. And I think this is the next level of identifying what it is. And now we're actually hearing the real stories without Oh, well, it, do you really think it was that? No, mm -hmm. we're, we're people are accepting it for what it is. And now we can talk about real solutions and inclusive solutions and not just solutions that make it look good. Mm -hmm. It's how do we truly change and be a transformative uh, place in Buffalo. And Rob, uh, obviously you're invested in, in, in doing this, but uh, uh, you see the value of it. You see progress million percent um I, I think in buffalo one of the benefits that we have is that um it is a small community you can get in front of the key leaders in town we'll uh one of the things that he did at our last session was uh convene a fishbowl conversation mm -hmm. and then one of the key leaders in town was uh, so impressed you know saying i'd love to do that with my board <laughs> right so i, I think that there's a, the uh format of discourse and the the diversity of types of discourse that this enables i think it's just a benefit to allowing for those conversations to happen across um, these these lines, that isolation index that we've unfortunately developed over generations here. I think that something that I look at with participating in this effort overall is it's a network of individuals that I get to see and celebrate their success, not just now, but across their careers. And I fully believe that 
the success that any one of us individually has is going to be based upon how many other people we watch succeed around us. So we don't have enough talent to be able to leave anybody on the sidelines, but also we don't have enough talent to not allow ourselves to elevate others. Mm -hmm. And this opportunity is a way for us to continue to build that bench of the future leaders. I'm not just talking about the CEOs at these employers. I think, again, going back to these first line supervisors, that there's a lot of passionate folks that are just looking for an opportunity to be part of creating a more equitable Buffalo. And this effort is one of those spaces that can try to activate that to get that positive feedback loop going. Stephanie, I'm going to let you give the final word here because we're running out of time, but I saw you had something to say. I want to make sure you get it in. Yeah, there's a stat that we often use when we're speaking with employers. If we close an economic and equity gap in our community, it's an extra billion dollars. So Buffalo and I are an extra billion dollars in our economy. That's a good word to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> we will uh, thank you uh, for, for being with us. Will Green from the University of Buffalo, Stephanie Pete from Say Yes, and Rob Latest from uh, Invest Buffalo, Niagara. Thanks very much for joining us today on What's Next. Thank you. This has been What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.